all about sharing his products with the community. Every community center, arena, uh, at the fairgrounds, every church in the, in the county had speakers in them. And most of the time it was a heresy. Paul started doing stereo around 53, because that's about when you were able to get stereo recordings and play back at the house. When he did change things over to a two-channel system, he also made the K-horn a three-way and started using two of them in the room. What he found was that because the K-horn had to be very tight into the corner, could make the center image less defined because he couldn't change the buildings that these speakers were going into. His answer was to put a third speaker there. So he created a circuit that would allow a two-channel amplifier to run in a bridge center mono mode so that you could hook a third speaker to a two-channel amplifier. The H version speaker come into play about 1957 or so. Paul did not design that speaker as a stereo speaker. So he designed the crossover for the early, what was to be the heresy, such that the HF and mid-range were full tilt. They weren't laid back at all. So the efficiency of that speaker was let run, whereas the efficiency of the woofer was dialed back a little bit because they didn't need that much mid-range, mid-bass out of the center spot to create that center image that Paul was looking for. Only after he started selling the speakers in stereo did he change the crossover network such that it was more balanced in a true full bandwidth stereo speaker. Early on, it was bandwidth limited, letting the mid-range and tweeter run so they could actually try and keep up with the K-horn, which segues into the next year in 58 when he realized that the heresy wasn't large enough to keep up with the K-horn and he built the Cornwall. But that's another story. I think the first brochures went out labeling it as the heresy in 73. The story's told that, you know, somebody's looking over Paul's shoulder and told him that the artwork he was drawing with a speaker that wasn't a fully horn-loaded speaker was heresy to his background, and Paul kind of liked it. I think internally, they agreed on heresy. Being in the Bible Belt, they kind of tried to work around that and went through a plethora of bad names <laughs> that were sent in. <laughs> so uh, heresy ended up sticking, and it works real well. You know, it wasn't long that they, they were running church ads where you know, you need a little heresy is good for the soul. <laughs> and no, I do not believe it was Bodark in the ad. Uh, Bo, or Bodark as we call him, was, uh, was around there for a long time. Great friends with the company. Once the speaker morphed from the H version speaker into the heresy, there were a few small changes that went on. Early on, they dropped the eight inch version went to the 12-inch version. It was still not quite enough, so they moved on to larger cabinets and different speakers in the product line as the center channel for the K-horns. And the Heresy moved out to the stereo speakers. The cool thing about the Heresy is its capability of, of keeping up with a much larger speaker than its physical size. Back in the 70s, the, the 901s and the 501s and 601s were the big thing on the market, you know. Everybody wanted that that small compact size and large output. But they had to connect an arc welder to it to run it because it was so inefficient. And you had to have the umbilical cords and special equalizers and all these hoops and and you know lights, buttons and bells that you have to have to make the system work like you'd like for it to work. Whereas the heresy, you get a cheap ass amplifier and plug into it with your turntable and all of a sudden you've got a unbelievably quality system and it can only get better from there. The better system, better amps, better source, all those things can make it better but just right out of the box compared to anything else on the market at the time, it was outstanding and still is. They've updated a lot of bits and pieces over the years. Heresy One, as it moved into a stereo system and started being a little more conscious of the people that was going to be in front of, changed to have more capabilities in the fit and finish of the speaker. Later on, once they started wrapping these cabinets in the Heresy 2 version, they actually started to do these knife edge corners on the cabinets. And basically, this is one board that has V cuts 
in it down to just shy of the veneer. And they take those and roll them up and roll that up to a box. And one of these corners is the glue point of those two ends of that board coming back together into a rectangle. What's cool about that is they don't break the veneer <laughs> in wrapping it. And uh, they do a lot of that type of work in the plant. Over the years, the Heresy One, they had built the boards out of edge-grained Baltic birch. And you could see the edge of the birch where it was cut and the layers of the plywood. Uh, after a period of time, they decided that they didn't want that seen. And let's face it, MDF was available and medium density fiber boards a lot easier to mill. So they actually put the trim, this trim on this board in the plant. And after that's done, they run it through a mill and mill the grooves. Then they lay it on the line, roll it up. And when they roll it up, they roll it with the front motor board and the back board inset into a groove. So it's really, really tight and built now. Unlike the version one, where you've got the board going vertical and the board going horizontal, meet and the grains change directions on the front of the speaker right here. Beautiful in my mind, because I love seeing that as a woodworker, I like seeing that stuff. But a lot of the, uh, shall we say, wife acceptance factor has moved into the speaker world and pretty knife edge corner is a lot more pleasing. And let's face it, we have to keep our wives happy if we want to keep playing in this world. <laughs> the size of the cabinets changed a little bit. The uh, materials used in the cabinet have changed. The materials used in the horns have changed. Uh, the drivers have changed. The crossovers have changed. From 1957, it stayed the H version speaker. Uh, you changed to the Heresy by name in 73. Heresy 2, they changed the makeup of the horn. It went from a metal horn to a molded horn. It went from the K77 to the 79 driver. The Heresy 3 uses the same basic driver assembly with a titanium diaphragm. The horn is virtually the same. It's changed a little bit for mounting purposes, but the coverage pattern is virtually the same. The mid-range horns change from being a K700 metal horn to a 701 plastic horn. The driver changed as well, went from the K55 in the original horn and driver to the K53, which is the compression driver without a horn on it. And then the woofer changed from a 22 to a 24, which was still square magnets. K24 changed in the, to a Heresy 3 to a 28, and now it's 28 by a different vendor, 28 ST, I believe. Always been a paper cone. It's always been a sinusoidal surround, meaning that if you would do a cross section of it, it would look like a sine wave. There's no sharp points. It's not an accordion. Some people call it accordion. It's not. It's a sine wave. Uh, and the reason for that is so it bends a specific way. The X max on this speaker is like 10 millimeters, meaning it can only move in and out as much as 10 millimeters, three eighths of an inch, a little less, which comes into break in. You know, it all, all is about this woofer. The horns, they'll break in a little bit, but that woofer is just like a new shock absorber. After a few hundred miles, it's perfect. You know, it's, it continually changes over the life of the speaker, but the life of the speaker is probably 100 years, so you'll be long gone before you'll hear the change in the drivers. Or if you're not, hallelujah. <laughs> or poor guy, <laughs> whichever the case may be. I wanted to take a second and talk about the back of this speaker, which is different than any other back of a Heresy speaker that we've seen. For a lot of years, this speaker was a sealed cabinet. And a sealed cabinet does a lot of things. It enables the speaker, the, the driver, the woofer in it to, uh, to handle a lot more power than it could in a base reflex cabinet because you've got the sealed enclosure and you can't move that speaker any more than the spring inside that closure, the air inside that closure will allow you. Whereas in a base reflex cabinet, you're fooling, for lack of a better word, convincing that woofer that this cabinet's three times bigger than it actually is. So that air spring is a lot softer. So therefore the driver can move a little bit more. Now, you never get something for free, right? Especially in audio or electronics. So you, you change some things about how the speaker works. One of the disadvantages of the port is what we know as chuffing or port noise. The same way as you whistle, 
a woofer moving air inside this cabinet will make that port whistle. And one of the things that Roy has done to eliminate that whistle as much as absolutely possible is using the same technology we use on our horns. He uses the Tractrix technology on the ports to reduce that amount of chuffing. I guess you could say the port has two mouths, one inside, one outside. They both have the same flares so that you don't create turbulence in that pipe that we call the port. The least amount of turbulence and the cleaner that airflow is, the less of that noise you'll hear. So the Heresy 1, 2, and 3 were sealed cabinets. The Heresy 4 being a ported cabinet, you gain about 10 hertz of bandwidth. The sealed cabinets, 58 hertz. The ported cabinet, 48 hertz on the low end. Now, 10 hertz doesn't seem like a lot, but when you start thinking about how hard it is to reproduce those low frequencies accurately to be able to say the speaker's 98 dB one watt one meter in that bandwidth, the output capability added at those frequencies is dramatic. Even though it sounds like small numbers, that's a long ways to go in a lot of output at that range. So the Heresy today sounds so much better on full range music simply because of adding that extra quarter octave or so in the bottom end. I grew up in the car audio world, so everything needs a subwoofer. <laughs> In my mind, this speaker needs a subwoofer to go with it and 2.1 to give you full bandwidth on, uh, on today's music, especially the, the electronic stuff that we do today. If you were strictly using our playing back music that was acoustically played, not electronic, then this speaker will cover just about every note played. The e string on a bass guitar is 42 hertz or so. If you're getting down in 48, you're very close to getting that full E string out of the speaker. Kick drum, 20 inch kick drum, about 42 hertz. So very, very close. Doesn't mean it will go away, it just means it won't be playing at 98 dB at that frequency. So throughout the years, the tweeter has changed a few times over this speaker. And one of the things that's changed lately on this driver is the face plug. Now that's that little round piece right dead center of that horn. You can think of that face plug as a extreme high frequency horn. As the sound comes off of that dome, it wants to separate and beam at different frequencies. So by adding the new face plug into this, you've reduced the amount of distortion, intermodulation, uh, total harmonic distortion out of that particular driver dramatically. And by doing so, you reduce the amount of those distortions in the entire speaker. There's a lot to be said about people building things in the United States. This is a product that's been built from its inception in the United States and in Hope, Arkansas. It's just as viable today in a home theater or a two channel system as it was in the early days. Over the lifetime of this speaker from 1957, the H version speaker to the Heresy's world, 1960s and 70s to today, the legacy of this product has brought more people into the fold of the Klipsch family than probably any other speaker Klipsch has developed.